We're gonna talk about vet visits in this video. In particular, this video is more aimed at the dogs that are a bit more anxious or nervous about going to the vet. Caveat to that being, if you're seeing any extreme signs of fear, I really recommend reaching out to a professional to work with you one-on-one. -on -one. But this video, again, for the anxious and nervous dogs, not necessarily the happy go lucky dogs of the world that are going to the vet, here's some different tips for you. So the first thing you wanna consider is, do I like my vet, <laughs> right? We wanna have a good relationship with our vet, especially with our anxious and nervous dogs, because our vet can actually make or break, or the vet staff can make or break that appointment, depending on what you're working on with them. And if you're watching this video, then you're probably trying to work with your dog on getting them better at going to the vet. And if you don't even really like your vet, that's not going to make very much progress forwards. You need to have a good relationship with your vet so that everyone can be on the same board in terms of your training plan that you're setting up for your dog. If we have a good relationship in the first place, if we like the veterinarian that we're working with, if our dogs are kind of okay with the veterinarians that we're working with, that can really make or break a training and behavior plan. So think about trying a new vet in the area. If you're looking to switch vets, if you just got your dog and you're searching for vets, just find one that you like, that you get a good vibe from and is willing to work with working your dog through their anxiety. A lot of times vets are very willing to work with this if you ask them. And a lot of times they're going to be in a big rush because they're under a ton of pressure. So please, please, please be nice to your veterinarians. Understand that they're under immense amounts of pressure. But if they are willing to help you and help your dog in that situation, that's going to be the best outcome for everyone involved. So most of them, if you bring it up are willing to help you. But if you're experiencing some backlash with that, try another vet, see if that's a better fit. Not that the first one wasn't, it just didn't suit you and your dog properly, so you can go find another one. I went through several ones to find the one that I currently have and love, and my dogs are making huge, huge strides when it comes to going to the vet, just because of the relationship that I've built with the vet. So if you're looking for a new vet, Go out and find a new vet, easy as that. The next thing that you can start to investigate is with maybe the new vet that you've picked or your existing vet, call them and ask if they do happy visits. A lot of veterinarians nowadays will do these. Essentially what a happy visit is, is you take your dog into the vet, but they're not actually there for a scheduled appointment. If you call the morning of and say, hey, can I bring my dog in for a happy visit today? Do you have the time? Sometimes they're totally slammed with clients all day and they really can't fit you in. It's totally okay if that happens. Breathe, be nice to your veterinarians and see if you can ask when maybe in the week you could possibly get your dog in for a happy visit. It's like a five to 15 minute thing that's not even scheduled in. You can take your dog into the office. A happy visit is all about getting your dog comfortable with the space without anything bad happening to them, which is so extremely valuable. And the best part about it is it's usually completely free of charge. So you can schedule this at any time. You can do it however often that you would like and you can come in few minutes, you're there up to like 10 or 15 minutes and just allow your dog to get used to the space without the techs being involved, without the vet being involved. I really recommend doing that first so your dog can kind of, if they're new to the space, get used to the space, build up some positive associations with the space. And if your dog is not new, it's their existing vet, you can rebuild back up those positive associations that they now have negative associations in that location with. So you can introduce some more positivity into it. Hey, Hey, guess what? We went that time and you didn't get poked and prodded. You just got a bunch of cheese and chicken and steak. We got to play with your toy. It was amazing. Then we left. We can actually help turn our dog's mindsets surrounding the vet around and into a more neutral place and undo some of the past damage that's been done. I say damage, more just negative associations with the place. We can start to kind of turn that around a bit. Once your dog has gotten the chance to do this with just the space itself, then you can start to bring the vet techs and the vets in. A lot of times um, when I've done this in the past, sometimes a few of the vets are in between clients and they'll just walk by and toss a few treats to my dog and then keep going. That's fantastic. Then the vet isn't handling them. I definitely prefer in those situations to not have the vet pet my dog or the vet techs pet my dogs whatsoever. Anytime their hands are on my dog, it usually results in not something great for them in their minds. So that's something that I try to stay away from and just say, hey, would you mind tossing a bit of steak to my dog? I'd super appreciate that. Or toss the ball to my dog. I'd super appreciate that. And then you can, you know, go back to what you were doing. Thank you so much 
for your help. Something easy like that. Then we can start to kind of introduce positivity to the people and the staff that are in that environment into that picture in your dog's brain as well. So having that as a part of the happy visit is great, although it totally depends on the tech's availability and the vet's av availability as well. I wouldn't expect that going into a happy visit, but it's a nice extra if you have it. There are some things you can start working on at home as well to help out your vet and your vet staff whenever you take your dog to the vet. Some basic conditioning and handling exercises can go a really long way. One thing that can be nice to condition your dog to at home is restraint. A lot of times vets and vet techs will want to, to some variation, restrain your dog whenever we're giving injections. And that's if you don't have some cooperative care plan set in place, which I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, um, but they'll want to do some sort of restraint Strain, especially if they don't know your dog, especially if the dog maybe is acting a little bit nervous. However, if you practice restraints with your dog at home, a lot of times kind of putting their head in a headlock and their head is right here and the rest of their body is this way um, is how a lot of vets will do it. But if you actually practice that with your dogs at home and just teach them it's a goofy, silly thing to do with you, then you in that situation can say, hey, I've practiced restraints with my dog at home. Would you be comfortable if I restrained my dog? while you gave the injection. A lot of times they're going to agree to this. A lot of times the dogs are a lot more comfortable with that and you can get the process done a whole lot faster and your dog has a lot more trust in you in that situation than a total stranger giving them a bear hug. So if you practice restraints at home, that can be super helpful ahead of time and you teach your dog this is just something that happens, it's really quick and then it's done and you get amazing, amazing things for that happening. But if you do it, it's gonna be a lot more comfortable for your dog. Um, so you can practice restraints, you can also practice just some general handling skills. What I would do with that is have some high value treats reach out and touch your dog and immediately start feeding the moment your hands are on your dog. The moment your hands come off your dog, food also stops. So we can start to teach the dogs whenever you're being handled, you get really awesome stuff. Whenever the handling stops, cool stuff stops as well. So if you practice that with all parts of your dog's body, a lot of times around their head, down near their paws and around their back end is gonna be the most uncomfortable regions to practice this with. But if you practice that with your dog, it can actually go a long way to helping in that vet visit as well. And you can be the one feeding in that situation. So when your, do when your dog, when your vet is handling your dog, you're actually in front feeding. The moment the vet touches your dog, you're immediately being like, yes, good boy, that's so good. You're feeding, 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 touching stops, you also stop. So we can replicate the same picture in the vet's office. It's gonna be a little more nerve wracking for your dog to do it there. But if they have experience with this at home, and if you even have a partner or um, another family member or a friend that can help you practice this at home, that can go a long way too. So your dog can see, okay, this is with one person and then this is also how it works with two people. Two people I'm completely comfortable with. Then we can transfer it to the vet as well. These are also things that you can practice during your happy visits just yourself. You go in, once your dog is comfortable with the space, they're comfortable with seeing the vet staff, comfortable relatively, right? They're taking food just fine. Okay, taking food is a big thing you wanna watch out for if your dog stops taking food. They're too stressed out. Also a good one to indicate that you might need some excess help during your happy visits. Once you get them comfortable at the place and then kind of the people, then you can start to practice this stuff in the veterinary office yourself without, again, the vet being there or the vet staff being there yet. You can go into the room, practice those restraints. You can go into the room and practice all that handling and keep doing that during those happy visits, not during an actual vet appointment, and you leave and nothing actually happened to your dog, and that's amazing. So you can practice these skills in the location that you're actually gonna need them in, which can really come in handy for when you actually need to take them to the vet. Okay, in addition to that, Muzzle training. I'm a huge advocate for muzzles. I've got a full muzzle training video here on my YouTube channel. Um, Wrigley is fully muzzle trained. This is a process I'm gonna start here pretty soon with Fen. Um, he's comfortable with a muzzle in general. He gets excited about it. I'm holding it and he's kind of wagging his tail looking at me right now. He knows it comes equipped with good things, but he's not fully muzzle trained at this point. We're working on it. Um, this in particular with the vet, I like as a precautionary thing and really an option for my vet staff. If I walk in there and my dog is throwing all sorts of anxious and nervous signals and is really kind of saying like, hey, I might choose to bite, 
that's going to make my vet nervous. That's going to make any vet tech nervous, especially if I have to, which I had to recently run my dog to an emergency vet that they're not familiar with. I want to make sure that everyone is safe in that situation. And I want to make sure my dog is comfortable in that situation as well. If my dog is fully muzzle trained, I can walk into that situation and actually tell them that, especially if they don't know my dog, I can say, Hey, just so you know, my dog is fully muzzle trained. Would you like me to put it on her just as a precautionary thing? We actually ended up taking this off halfway through our visit. She was doing so great. She didn't actually need it and the vet staff fell in love with her. But this absolutely is something that can be an option for the vet staff, especially if they don't know your dog or if your dog is throwing all sorts of anxious signals towards them, they're gonna request anyways, hey, do you mind if we muzzle the dog? If the dog is already muzzle trained, that is a non-issue. That actually is gonna make your dog feel a whole lot more confident and comfortable, especially if it's an emergency situation. As a not so nice example to think about, if your dog were hit by a car and they're in pain, a dog is gonna bite. A dog that is in pain is 100% going to bite. So if your dog is already conditioned to wearing a muzzle, that is not going to add more stress to their lives. It's gonna keep everyone safe and it's going to allow any vet staff to treat them a whole lot faster which in that situation literally could save your dog's life. So it's less of something that my dog is going to bite, so I'm going to muzzle them. Yes, do that if that is the case. But for my case with Wrigley, she's never tried to bite anybody, but she's very, very nervous at the vet sometimes, and it makes people worried. So this is more for others to make others feel a whole lot more safe about the situation, and Wrigley's very happy about wearing her muzzle. I call it her party hat. So if you're um, looking for more tips on muzzle training, check out my video that I made. I'll, I'll leave it in the description below so you can see. If you're interested in diving more into what we call cooperative care, okay, that's your dog participating in their care, opting in, opting out. Um, we basically teach them you have a choice in the matter and we can teach them different behaviors surrounding that. But we respect them when they choose to say no. We respect them when they choose to say yes, I'm ready to go. Um, there's different ways that we can go about this. I'm not going to go too much into it in this video. If you want to know some more information about that, check us out on Patreon. I do a lot of cooperative care stuff and I have things coming up that I'm going to be doing a lot more cooperative care stuff with my dogs. The only thing I would recommend there is if you're doing cooperative care stuff like for example teaching my dogs to opt into nail trims they offer me their paw happily sit there while I trim their nails and then they're ready to go rather than me having to restrain them or pin them down, which is not something I would do, but really forcefully having to do the thing I need to do, I would rather ultimately that they choose to interact with that situation, which is why I'm training cooperative care stuff with them. Um, however, sometimes, and this happens frequently, sometimes our dogs don't get a choice. Sometimes we just have to do the thing to them that they don't ideally want to happen to them. I would recommend if you're working on both of those things, sometimes you have to do the thing to your dog, but most of the time you're working on cooperative care for that thing, do them in completely separate locations, literally in your house. If I'm working on cooperative care stuff, I'm usually working on it here in our living room on this rug. My dogs get a choice in that context. If I have to just trim their nails, we're going to a completely different room of my house. It's typically the bathroom upstairs and I just do it. I'm not going to lure my dog into that situation. I'm not going to give them a false sense of hope or security that they get a choice in the matter. I'm not necessarily going to use a whole lot of food in advance with that one. I'm just going to do it as quickly as I can. And then they get a whole lot of goodies afterwards because I don't want them getting confused between the two. Eventually the idea is the cooperative care training actually takes over and they participate in all of their care. But sometimes we just have to do the thing. So I don't want to lure them into that situation with them thinking like, ah, like, cool, I get to say yes, I get to say no, when I actually just have to do the thing to them, that's actually gonna ruin all the training that I did in advance. So I would separate those two things out completely and make the picture different for your dog. When you actually go to the vet, I'd recommend thinking about a few things. One, when you schedule. Sometimes if you schedule the very last appointment of the day or the very first appointment of the day, there's not too many people 
people around yet, especially if your dog is nervous of other dogs or people in general, you can kind of sneak in and out without experiencing much of that at all, which can be to your benefit. So think about and ask your vet when would be an ideal time to schedule where it's a little bit quieter. That's not like a super busy Saturday morning, so to speak. So talk with your vet, but that's a tip that I have there. What to bring with you, I would recommend bringing a variety of different things. You're not gonna care about calories whenever you go to the vet with your anxious or nervous dog. Bring a lot of different things. You might bring things like steak, like literal cooked bacon that you prepped in your oven. You might bring um, a raw meaty bone for them to work on. You might bring like the best of the best to that visit, and I would bring three or four different things. If they get bored of one thing, you've got more in your backpack that you can switch out. Toys, if your dog likes toys. Fen and I typically, when he goes to the vet, whenever we're in the waiting room, we'll play with toys while we're waiting for the vet to come in. That's another tip that I have as well. If you can avoid it, try not to sit in the lobby with your anxious and nervous dog. They're just gonna see a lot of other anxious and nervous dogs coming in and out of that building, especially if other dogs or people make them anxious or nervous. Sitting in that is really not gonna be helpful for them whatsoever. Leave them in your car and go in first and say, hey, like we're here, I've got my dog out in the car. Would you mind if we waited until an exam room became available and then I can just take my dog straight back and we don't have to wait out here. Most vets will accommodate that. You just have to let them know about it. Again, be nice to your vet staff. If you have to wait, you have to wait and that's perfectly fine. But that's gonna be really helpful is bypassing the lobby. Once you get into the exam room, what I recommend doing if your dog is capable of taking food in that moment is trying to play different games with them. You might toss treats around the room. You might toss treats from their nose down to the floor if they don't want to explore the room. Can they take food? You Can you just hand feed food? Can we, if we can get their brains essentially down this like food track, sometimes we can kind of get them out of that nervous and anxious headspace and onto a more productive headspace in that context. Sometimes that's not gonna be the case. Sometimes the dogs are not gonna wanna take food if they just want comfort from you. Fantastic, you can comfort them in that situation. But if we can do what we can to make our dogs feel a little bit better about the situation, for Wrigley, it's asking her to do different behaviors like a nose touch or a sit or a down if she wants to. Um, treat tosses around the room. If though I'm asking for behaviors and she says, I can't do this right now, like a down for instance, if I ask her to lie down and she does not lie down, there is no way I'm going to ask her to lie down again. I'm taking that as a no, I'm too uncomfortable in this, in this situation in order to lie down, I'm not going to. That is an okay thing in that situation for her to almost decline that request. The purpose of me doing that is just to get her brain somewhere else. I don't need her in that context to actually follow through with that behavior, especially if she's really anxious and really nervous. Fen, on the other hand, again, I play with a ball. A ball is his like high value reinforcer. So we can build up a lot of positive associations with that room and it get his brain on a different track by playing. And playing, if he can play, is a good gauge for me on how he's actually feeling about the situation. When you're actually meeting with the vet staff, don't be afraid to advocate for your dog. Don't be mean about it. There's a really nice way to do it. But you might say, hey, you know, I've been working on this procedure, whatever it might be at home. Do you mind if we try that during today's visit? I just want to see where my dog is at with it. Most vets are going to be totally accommodating to that because if you're working on stuff at home, that actually makes their jobs a whole lot easier. So yes, mention it. You have to mention it though. The vet is not going to be able to read your mind and say, hey, like, have you been working on anything at home that I need to know about? Most of them won't ask. They just need to get their jobs done. So if you have something that you've been working on, like let's say it's like a chin rest and your dog holds their chin on your knee while the vet does their exam, tell your vet that. Advocate for your dog if you are working on restraintless contact. Again, more of a cooperative care type of thing, but not restraining your dog for an injection, but actually having them target their head on something. A lot of dogs don't do well with restraint, which is why we can teach them an alternative behavior. But the vet tech is gonna try to restrain your dog if you don't say something. So you have to say something if you're working on something at home, but say it in a nice way. Same sort of thing in the vet. If something has to get done, it has to get done and 
you can handle that however you best see fit. Sometimes I'll make a completely different visit if I feel like my dog is kind of at her limit to what she can handle. I'll make a follow-up visit and pay you to see the vet again to split out essentially what we need to get done if there's a lot that needs to get done. Um, typically blood draws can be really involved so I'll make a, their own separate appointment for that so I can kind of prep my dog for it and she's not getting many other injections or exams or handling at the same time that she's also going to get a blood draw. That's too much for her. So I'll make separate appointments for the different things that need to get done if it's a lot in one visit. And you are completely welcome to ask about that and welcome to do that as well. If you happen to have a dog that is really solid at the vet, bring that dog along with your nervous dog. A lot of times that can be a huge confidence boost for our secondary dogs that are a little bit anxious and nervous. That can be a huge help for some dogs. So if you happen to have that, take advantage of it. Just call the vet's office and make sure that's okay ahead of time. So that was a lot of tips. <laughs> all in one. Um, essentially, just ask. Like a lot of this is just ask your vet what is okay, what is not okay. Hey, can we do this a certain way? Can we adjust this just like this? You can do that. <laughs> Feel free to ask your vet different questions. Um, the other thing that I'll add is if you are feeling like you're making some progress with this, but ultimately your dog is so shut down at the vet and they're so scared, talk to a trainer or behaviorist. We can definitely help you out. Um, the other thing that you can talk to your vet about is some anxiety medication for that situation in particular. Wrigley takes anxiety medication whenever she goes to the vet. I would talk specifically to your vet if they feel that that would be a good option for your dog and what options are actually available. I hope this video was helpful for you guys. This is just some tips that I practice with my own dogs. I recommend to clients. There's definitely many, many more. This is kind of just a good starting point. So if you have any questions, if if I left something huge out, let me know in the description down below. If you want to learn some more about cooperative care type stuff and your dog actually opting in and participating in their own care, follow us over on Patreon. That's a lot of the videos that I post over there and coming up, we're going to be working on some specific things as well. So feel free to give us a follow. Um, yeah. And I hope you guys have an awesome rest of your week and I'll see you in our next video.